Thank you, Mark, and shalom everyone, or should I say shalom y'all. <laughs> Truly a privilege for my wife Sissy and me uh, to be with you here today, and um, I'd like to just take a moment um, with a debt of gratitude to doctors Mark Bailey and Mark Yarborough from DTS for making this program we talked about possible and also to Dr. Scott Barfoot, who has been exceedingly gracious, along with others on the staff of DTS in administering the uh, DMIN program. Also wanna thank a dear friend from Hong Kong, Richard K. Lee, that helped us fund some of the program from the Israel side, after Dallas graciously, after DTS graciously already done that from this side. And I wanna thank all of our staff at One for Israel, and especially my friend and colleague, Dr. Seth Postel, our academic dean, who's seated here with the faculty. So thank you. I'm excited and humbled to stand before you today, and I'm doing that as a Jewish-Israeli disciple of Jesus. Part of the reason I feel so excited and so humbled is because in this room, and I'm talking particularly about the graduates, are the, some of the future leaders of the global church, there's some international students here, but especially the American church. And, and part of what I'm gonna share with you today, I wanna plead with each one of you to adopt a global perspective. And a word to, our, to the American graduates um, from a non-American that loves America. And I hear a lot of my friends concerned of the processes that America's uh, going through. America is still the most missionary sending and missionary funding country on the planet. God is not done with America, and I'm thankful to you. Now, in case you are wondering about the uh, title of this short message, um, we can go to the next slide, please. So, it comes from this cartoon. Some of you may know this, the Far Side Cartoons by Gary Larson. And, um, you know, those two deer are just at the opening of hunting season, and one of them has a birthmark of a, of a target on his chest. And um, I was thinking about this cartoon when I was praying for you as graduates, really. And I was uh, reminded in a conversation I had with a friend of mine many years ago. It was a short time after this friend was appointed to a senior spiritual position in the National Church in Israel. And I met with him and I said, well, how are you feeling? How's it going? And he says, I feel as if somebody has drawn a target on my chest and everybody's just shooting at me from all directions. Now, the reason I thought about that about you is because it may already be part of your experience, but if not, on this next step, um, it will be. You know, it's as, as believers in the Messiah, Jesus, in a built-in fashion in the world we're living in, we have a target upon us. As Christian leaders, we will get an extended dose of, of those. It just comes with a turf. So um, welcome to hunting season, and you are it. However, I would like to submit to you that besides that, while it'd be tempting to think about it or feel it sometimes at certain times, the calling that you have is a wonderful and a high calling. Now, uh, I want to tell you very briefly about a few things that's going on in Israel and the Jewish world, and I'll tell you why in a moment, why I think it's maybe relevant and important to you. But just as some background about Peter. Here he is, a fisherman from the Galilee, that his world and life course was destined or dictated by generations of his forefathers. I mean, he was destined to be a fisherman, not particularly wealthy or particularly um, educated, you know, far out there in the Galilee of the Gentiles, away from Jerusalem, the spiritual center, away from Rome, the world center. And yet the Messiah sees him, he chooses him, he calls him to serve him, and he gets to visit uh, those different places. And um, I think many of us can identify with that kind of an experience. Now, towards the end of his life course, or life uh, race, Peter is writing the first, what we call the first epistle of Peter. And in it, he tried to distill his experience and wisdom to the church and to every segment in the church. Peter is also the one, along with the first apostles, that has been deposited, initially deposited, the good news of the Messiah. 
that have encircled the globe in those 2,000 years. Now, interesting to see that it kind of went westbound and circled the globe, and it's, it's kind of coming back. Uh, Ezekiel calls the place that it all began, the nation of Israel, the, the country, the land of Israel, he calls it the center of the world in chapter 38. And um, so interesting to think about, and as Mark mentioned, the good news of the Messiah have come back to the Jewish people worldwide, but also especially in Israel in a powerful way. Now, many years ago, I had a, a very experience, well, many years ago, actually almost exactly 30 years ago, I started following Jesus myself. And shortly after that, I got, got very involved in a local church and had one of the um, formative experiences in my life. I volunteered to teach the children. I didn't know how to do it. I was really petrified. And so I asked the lady that was in charge, how do we do that? She says, well, I'm going to give you a flannel graph. Some of you may have had that. It's this little flannel board, and you have cloth uh, figures to put on it to explain and illustrate. And um, why am I telling you this? Because in a lot of ways, what God is doing with the Jewish people, and particularly the state of Israel, the nation of Israel, has to do with his timetable for humanity. And among ourselves, we many times call that we say it's it's not about Israel. I'm going to talk a little bit about Israel. It's not about Israel. It's about the God of Israel. But Israel is that flannel graph, and so I think it's relevant. Now, if we look at the relationship of the church and the Jewish people over the last 2,000 years, we can summarize it in a sentence and says it was not good. We see that in the pages of the New Testament when the Jewish authorities are the majority and they're persecuting the believers in Christ, Christ himself, of course, and also the believers in Christ, the disciples of Christ. But Soon after, in the centuries that followed and throughout church history, the balance of power shift, and unfortunately, many atrocities were done to the Jewish people by people that claim to, to be the disciples of Jesus and do it in his name, but unfortunately, they've done exactly the opposite of what Jesus has taught them. However, when people started reading their Bible in the, um, after the Reformation especially, they recognize that from Genesis through the New Testament, God has, in, well, in Paul's words in Romans 1.16, the gospel is to the Jew for, first or foremost and also to the non-Jew. So people started sharing the gospel with it, attempting sharing, sharing the gospel with the Jewish people. However, you know, when they came to us, they didn't look like us, they didn't talk like us, they didn't know our customs, our language. And so it was re received by Jewish people as something strange and foreign that is brought to us by people not from among our people and who wish to give us, oh, the irony, a foreign God. And so the Jewish world has been formed in a way, for most of those 2,000 years, formed in a way that the gospel has not been able to penetrate in any way. So I want to give you um, the fastest less than you ever had about Jewish demographics. And it's particularly Jewish demographics of the last 100 years. I want to take you back to 1939, just before World War II. At that time, there are approximately 16 million Jewish people living around the world. Only less than half a million reside in Israel. Most of the Jewish people at that time reside in Europe, about 10 million. And of those 10 million, Several tens of thousands, some even say as many as a quarter of a million, are Jewish believers in Christ already in Europe. And my wife's family are among them. When the Nazi regime came to power and the Holocaust took place, the six million Jewish people were murdered, among many others, and among them most of the Jewish believers in Christ. The Jewish World Center, and this is important, has moved after World War II from Europe to America. That's been the Jewish center since 48. Now, when the state of Israel is established in 48, there are about 10 million Jewish uh, people remaining in the world. Less than 1 million reside in Israel. My family or my grand late grandparents among them. Now, here's the interesting statistic, and this is where I want to get with this. In this day and age, I mean, now 73 years after the state of Israel is established, there are approximately 13 and a half million people in the world, Jewish people in the world. Of them, 7.2 million reside in the state of Israel. I'll put it another way. There are more Jewish people that reside in Israel today than in the rest of the world combined. Why should you care and why it's interesting? Because God said he would do it. 
and through most of church history, it seemed absolutely and in every way unthinkable, unimaginable that a majority of Jewish people will come back to the land, reside there, and use Hebrew as their spoken language. But yet we were blessed to live in an age that this is happening, and it's important, as I said, because God said that it would happen. Now, even more interesting than that, and that's the slide in front of you, this is a slide about the Jewish people and the remnant of Israel, the believers in Christ in Israel, particularly in the land, physic, physical land of Israel. So I read in the first century, you know, there were tens of thousands who believe. Through most of church history, there were very, very, very few. When, it, when the state of Israel is established in 48, there are 23 Jewish believers in Christ in the entire country. There's not one church of Jewish believers that gather. Today, almost 70 some years after that, 73 years after that, there are more than 300 churches of Jewish believers in Christ and more than 30,000 Jewish people that uh, openly claim to be believers in Christ and fellowship in those churches. We actually think the, the number is much, much larger than that, uh, but that's a humble estimate. Now, more than that, the Jewish world, the general Jewish world, has been moving from America back to Israel, a process that began 30 years ago, really exacerbated in the last 10 years. And also, as Mark has mentioned, there is a spiritual awakening that's taking place in Israel. And more Jewish people are hearing about the Messiah, and more and more Jewish people. You know, I, I started following, when I started following Christ, I would talk to people, my friends, I became a student, and every time I would get the same response, they would look at me, hear the way I speak Hebrew, and they would tell me, but you're, you're Jewish, how come you talk to us about Jesus? Who's ever heard about a Jewish person that believes in Jesus? Well, when we talk to our families, our friends, our people now, they still may not agree with us, but they heard that it's a growing group of Jewish people that are believers in Jesus. Now, the last thing I want to tell you about that, next slide, please. Oh, here it is. There's a process that's even more important. Um, and the more important process is the qualitative, the qualitative process that's going on among the Jewish people. Most of the testimony to Jewish people today most of it takes place by other Jewish people. And so they cannot come to us and say, oh, you're bringing a foreign God and, you know, go where, back to where I come from. You know, we have only an Israeli passport. They're stuck with us. We're not going anywhere. And so the dynamic changed from you and us to us and us. And it's also important for me to say that as Jewish believers in Christ, we need... We need the church, the entire church. One of the important and often neglected missiological uh, tasks of the church is to cause the Jewish people to jealousy. And it, I, I find it particularly uh, symbolic and also very humbling, to be completely honest, that I get to speak with you and, and be the speaker today when it's Dr. Yarborough's uh, first commencement as a president. And so, Mark, I want to thank you for that as well. Thank you. So going back to Peter, by the way, they gave me 20 minutes, but I come from the Middle East. You know, so 20 minutes in the Middle East is something completely different and, you know, I'll, I'll try to be civil. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to go through those verses in 1 Peter 5. We read in verses 6 and 7, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And I'm particularly talking to the graduates today and now. God has called you to a position of influence and leadership. You need to know your place. Knowing your place pr uh, primarily means humble yourself before God. Because there are several things in leadership that are very tempting. One of them is pride. You know, I've graduated. I have the know-how. Well, praise God that you do. But it's, it can be tempting for us to confuse our biblical and theological knowledge with our own spirituality and our own need for the Lord. And so I beseech you to always preach the gospel to yourselves, that we are, I am, saved in the grace of Christ, and that without Him I can do absolutely nothing. So... Um, you know, that, that's one side of it, the pride. The other side is what I would call over-responsibility. And if you're like me, your favorite hour for, to worry about things is 2 a.m. And I know that when I wake up in 2 a.m. several nights in a row and I think about something and I worry about something, 
I need to cast it upon him because he truly cares, not just for me personally, but also for the things that he's deposited to me. It's his responsibility. I want to be faithful, but it's on him. So allow yourselves to rest under God's care. Verse 8, be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Take your ministry seriously. It can be tempting after a while to think, well, I got this. I got this. And we need to remember there is a very active adversary that would like nothing more than to destroy our name so that he can destroy Christ's name. And so um, there are several things that are, that are danger as, as Christian leaders, and I think one of them is a gap, what I call a gap, between your public image and your personal life. And I remember a conversation I had with a pastor friend a few years ago, and he told me how he is meeting for um, counseling with one of the elders at his church. This elder was having marital problems, some issues, and um, the pastor was counseling him, and after a few sessions, things got a lot better, and so the elder asked the pastor, well, pastor, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? And the pastor uh, started telling him, says, well, actually, since you ask, my wife and I are going through a little bit of a difficult time ourselves, and he's starting to share a little bit of what's going on, and, and the elder stopped him and said, no, no, pastor, pastor, stop. You're my pastor. I mean, you can't tell me those things. You counsel me. I don't counsel you. Basically, now this is an extreme example, granted, but a true one. And the message was clear. You have, you need to have a perfect public image because you're the pastor or you're the leader. And of course, it, it, uh, it can feel very lonely in, in leadership, but we truly need, truly need not only our spouses, and I'm, I'm so glad that we've um, recognize the spouses and, and friends and family members, but we need also a living community around us. And if you remember only one thing of everything I've said today, please let it be the following. No matter what season in your life you are, pick two or three people you trust. And if you're married, you have a built-in in that in your wife or your husband, but other than them, some others around you. Pick two or three that you trust that want your best and ask them Ask them to correct you and rebuke you if they see that your life is not in line with, with the Word of God and your walk with the Lord. So that's going to be a tremendous, tremendous gift. <laughs> Verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. I want to put a particular emphasis on what I referred to earlier as the global outlook. No matter what your ministry is, always adopt a global outlook. And um, it's a lot easier in our day and age than it uh, used to be previously, um, just because we truly live in a global village. And I already mentioned to our American brothers and sisters uh, the important place that God has for America in this, but it's true for all of us. And I uh, did a little bit of a research on how the global church has fared during this last unusual year of COVID. And here's what I found. It's from an open door report. And they said that uh, according to their uh, research and reality, one of eight Christians in the world that comes out to 340 million live in places when there was, they experienced high levels of persecution and discrimination uh, this, in this last year of, of the COVID experience. And it manifested in three particular ways. The first is denying aid from Christians solely on the basis of their faith. In other words, you know, everybody's in lockdown. There's no food. There's no employment. The government or different agencies uh, bring food, and they give it to everyone except the Christians because they are Christians. So that has been reported in, in large measures in India, Myanmar, Nepal, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Central Asia, Malaysia, North Africa, Yemen, and Sudan. And, and some of us, you know, we, we reside in countries not far from there. These are our brothers and sisters. Second way that it, was, uh, it is manifested or was manifested is neglect of Christian workers. 
and pastors in majority world. Why? Because there were no church meetings. People were in lockdowns, still in lockdowns, actually, in a lot of places. And because there are no meetings, there are no donations for the, for the pastor or the leader, and therefore they have no livelihood and they have to seek it elsewhere. As a result, the church suffers because there's nobody that kind of gathers the flock. And thirdly, the lockdowns, the many lockdowns in, in, um, that have taken place in this last year meant that new believers from majority faith areas have spent a lot of time with their unbelieving family members. It was particularly difficult for young women because a lot of pressure, well, not that men didn't, but the women often were kidnapped against their will and forced to marry. Now, this is in 2020, 2021. What do we do about it? What can I do about it? You know, something that I beseech all of us to adopt and pray over. Verse 10. But the God of all grace, who has called you unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. I, I mentioned the tendency to uh, over-worry, and those kind of things take over-relationship, uh, over-responsibility. So I often tell myself, and I tell some of my friends around me, when there's a difficult situation, there is a Messiah, but it's not me. His name is Jesus. It's really on him. I can bring things to him. So you can trust in God's sanctifying grace, first and foremost, for you, for us. I mean, we are a work in progress. And so the different things that happen to each one of us, and, you know, even when we are, we do feel like a bummer of a birthmark, when people are shooting at us, when things happen, God is shaping us to be more like him. And I can share you know, personally, I have a, a relationship in the last several years, a very difficult relationship with a, a brother that, you know, many, many traits about him I love and admire, but we have some pretty significant disagreements on various things. And I, for years, have been praying for this relationship, and God somehow allows it to remain. And I can say it has drove me to my knees more than, almost more than anything else in the last several years. So if nothing else, God is using it in my life to work on my prayer life and to um, make me more like him. Now, finally, as Mark has mentioned, uh, for you graduates, you know, this marks not just the end of the studies, but the beginning of a calling. And there is a time that comes, no matter who we are, there's a time that we will, as if, return the keys of our ministry or whatever it is that God is calling us to do. We, we're going to retire, we're going to die, or whatever like that, you know, go to be with the Lord. I'm not saying it is in a grim way, but it's going to happen. Five years, 35 years, it will happen. And when that day comes, I pray two things for you and for each one of us. The first thing is that when all the degrees and all the titles are, you know, stripped from us, as it were, each one of us still takes great joy in the fact that we are, I am still a beloved son of God with eternal life in the Messiah. And that is our true identity. And no matter where we are, what we do, what phase we are, that is our true identity. So when, our, when we are in, in a season or at a time where we're tempted to look at our calling and say, it, it is a bummer of a birthmark, remember, it's actually a wonderful and blessed calling. And if we could go to the last slide. I want to finish with a, uh, a traditional blessing that I want to pronounce on, on all of us. I'll, Say it in English, and I'll finish in Hebrew. Blessed are you, Lord our God, the King of the universe, who has granted us life, sustained us, and enabled us to reach this occasion. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, sheikhiyanu, vekiyemanu, veigiyanu, lazman Amen. Thank you.